Hey. All right. Hey, I'll be with you. Oh, and um, so I want to welcome you to our STEM Career Showcase. Thank you for inviting us into your classroom today. Today's session is brought to you from the Community Education Center for Elk and Cameron Counties and the Penn State Extension 4-H. This month, we are recognizing National Manufacturing Day, and today we hope to provide you an opportunity that will gain you more insight and exposure in the field of manufacturing and to assist you in analyzing your own future career choices. If we look at today, about 40% of the world's powdered metal parts are produced um, in North Central Pennsylvania for applications in the automotive industry, lawn and garden products, home appliances, and so much more. Approximately 56 powder metal, metal manufacturing firms provide employment for over 10,000 people. So that's a lot of jobs. And many of these manufacturers can trace their roots right back here to St. Mary's, um, which is why this region is known as the powdered metal capital of the world. So while there are many industries in manufacturing today, we are gonna focus on powdered metals. Um, and to start us off, uh, I'm going, we have an activity. So I guess our agenda today is we have an activity that we're going to do and it takes some time to set. So we're gonna do part one of the activity to start off. And then we're gonna look at um, powdered metals and have a little um, chat with uh, Jason and his company and then we'll come back to finish the activity. So at this time, I'm gonna throw it over to um, Natalie Alio and she'll get you started with the um, activity. Awesome, thank you, Amy. Um, so everyone, at your desk, you guys should have a bag of cereal, a magnet, and you guys probably have a bottle of water, but I have a cup of water, okay? What we want to do, first of all, inside, this cereal is, is called total cereal. Has anybody, raise your hand if you have ever eaten or maybe your parents eat a cereal that's called total. Anybody ever hear of it? Personally, it doesn't have a lot of sugar in it, so it's probably not something that a lot of you guys would eat, but um, I know that my dad used to eat it. But there are some things in our breakfast cereals that seem kind of odd. And we're going to pull something out of our breakfast cereal today, and it's going to be related a little bit to what Mr. Gobbler is going to be talking about also. So I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but I am going to tell you that it's going to be magnetic. So we're going to use our magnet to help pull those things out, but we don't need our magnet yet. We're gonna set it aside. What I want you guys to do, I'm gonna put my video down here on my table so you guys can see what I'm doing. I want you to open your cereal bag, but you have to open it very carefully. Don't pull it really hard because you don't want to break the seams and you don't want to spill your cereal, okay? So everybody open up your cereal bag. This is gonna be a really easy process to get started. What we want to do is we want that, you know what happens when you leave your cereal sit in milk for too long and it gets all soggy? We're gonna make our cereal soggy. That thing that it's going to pull out is going to come out easier when our cereal is soggy. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to take our water and carefully dump it into our cereal. We don't want to spill our water and we don't want to spill, um, we don't want our cereal to fall out either. So we're going to carefully stick it into our cereal. I don't know, um, Amy, is my video, the big video on the screen right now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, because it wasn't, it wasn't for me I, and I was getting confused. So now we have this bag full of watery cereal, right? The kids are wondering if they should put all of it in. Their whole yes, bag. put all of it in. That's a very good point. Yeah, put it all in. You guys can see how my cereal is kind of floating around a little bit. It's going to get nice and mushy. When you're done, and this is probably the most important part, you want to pull some of the air out of there, but you want to make sure that your bag is sealed really well so you can hear it click. And to test it, we don't want to turn it upside down, but we want to kind of open the top a little bit and give it a little tug 
and make sure that it's completely sealed. Okay, so make sure you seal it up tight. And then once we're done with that, we're gonna set that aside and you can let it lay like this if you want, but we just, we're gonna let that cereal get nice and soggy in there. We're gonna let it sit for as long as our presentation goes because the longer it sits, the better it's going to work, okay? So you guys can move that off to the side. If you would like, try not to, try to just ignore it for a little while because we don't want to squeeze it or anything like that either. We don't want it to break open or else it might not work. Okay? Okay. That's all for our setup. So we will finish that up as soon as we're done with everything else. Okay. So I am just going to share my screen and um, I'm going to start off with showing um, a press, which is what is used in powdered metal manufacturing. Uh, so the powders that Mr. Gobbler provides to the manufacturing companies turns into these products. So just so that you can kind of understand what happens with the powders, I'm going to show a video real quick before we talk with Mr. Gobbler so you kind of have an understanding a little bit. We begin with metal powders, and those metal powders may be a single metal, or it may be an alloy uh, that has been formed into that powder. And that's a very specific engineered product. Uh, that is combined with a lubricant. Uh, that mixture <clears throat> is put into a compaction press. Uh, we compact the shape into what's called a green part, and uh, that will have a pretty low strength, I mean, certainly enough to handle, but I always say it's like the strength of an aspirin tablet. You can, if you try hard, you can break an aspirin tablet. Uh, the, the structural properties, the end properties that you're looking for from the product are not gonna be in that green part, but it begins with the shape. So the PM process is kind of unique. You get a shape first, and then you get the properties. The properties are all developed in that sintering furnace. So for uh, steel, will be in the 2000 Fahrenheit range or about 1100 degrees Celsius range. Uh, certain atmospheres are used in the steel world. We use uh, nitrogen as a protective atmosphere. Hydrogen is often used as a uh, deoxidation or reducing atmosphere. It takes the oxides off uh, all metal particles that have that oxide. We go through the sintering process and many, many things are going on. It's a fairly complex uh, set of phenomena that occur in there. But one thing is, first of all, to, as we go in the sintering furnace, we take out the lubricant, which is no longer necessary. We only needed the lubricant so we could eject the part out of the dime. Now we have to take that lubricant out. That's done in the, in the preheat sections of the furnace. As you go into the higher temperature sections of the furnace, the temperature goes up, and now we get actually particle to particle bonding. We also get alloying from one particle to another. Uh, different elements that may be involved. Uh, we, the por porosity is reduced. Uh, we will develop the strength that really is recognizable that, that you need in the end product. So we're building the properties of strength at the sintering process. Okay. So that is um, just to show you uh, the process of manufacturing that happens um, a lot in our area, the factories that are in our area and um, what they are making. So Mr. Gobbler, do you, would you like me to show them the video of the blending so that they can kind of see inside your factory first and see the big blender? That would, or did you that want would to be great. Words that first? Would be great. Sure. Let me I mean, to do that. Idea what we do then. Okay. Um, so students, I'm going to share now a video that uh, goes right into Mr. Gobbler's factory called Advantage Metal Powders. Now his company provides the powder that starts the whole process. So let me um, share this again. Hi, 
I'm Jason Gobbler, sales manager for Advantage Metal Powders here in Ridgeway, Pennsylvania. Advantage Metal Powders is a blending facility primarily for the powder metal industry. We are an ISO 9001-2008 accredited uh, blending facility with full testing of all the materials that we manufacture here in a standard 35 procedure via MPIS specs. Here at Advantage Metal Powders, we are going to talk about blenders today. We do have seven different blenders in production, ranging from orders that we can do as little as five pounds all the way up to 45,000 pounds, which is a truckload quantity. The blender behind me is the largest blender that we have. 45,000 pounds of material can be loaded into this blender. Blending is when we take raw iron, powder, add whatever needed for the customer specification, whether it be copper, nickel, graphite, lubricant, um, those types of materials to make a blend to what the customer specifies. If you'd like to discuss further blending with me or email me my information, phone number, email address, or if you want to check us out on our website, look at advantagempi.com. I'm going to turn this blender on just to show you what the 45,000 pounds, the size of the blender looks like spinning. Hi. Hey, students. So that's um So that's a peek inside of Mr. Gobbler's plant. And I'm going to throw it over to him uh, to tell us a little bit more about his company and, um, you know, what they do there. Uh, thank you, Amy. My name is Jason. I don't know if any of you has ever uh, heard of the Summit Hotel or Restaurant in Ridgeway, but uh, if you've eaten over there, they got really good wings and hamburgers. But my plant is right across the street from them in Ridgeway. Uh, we've been uh, around since 2001. And we currently employ 20 different people. Um, the types of jobs that we have here uh, are ranging from accountants to engineers to salespeople to, to laborers on the floor. Uh, there's some of the guys that actually weigh up the, the materials, the powder, the, the ingredients, and they put it together and put it into that blender that Amy just showed us. Um, what we, like Amy said, what we do is there's over 50 different companies that we sell our powder to in just this area where they make, they take our powder and they make all kinds of different parts. Um, the, this here part, anybody have any idea what this might be? It's a connecting rod. So uh, the bus that you rode in on today or the the car that your parents brought you to, to school in today, if it's a four-cylinder car, it has four of these in it. If it's an eight-cylinder, it has eight of these in it. Just to give you an idea, there's roughly 640 parts in every vehicle that you drive in. So your mom's car, your dad's truck, the school bus that you drove in on, there are over 600 parts in that vehicle that are made out of powdered metal. So uh, my plant here, we blend together different ingredients like iron, copper, nickel, lubricant, graphite, and we blend it together just like uh, your blender at home where you, where you want to make a milkshake. You throw all the different ingredients in there, blend it together. That's what we do, and then we sell it to the people that make parts like this. Now, about half of those parts in each car, those 640 or 650 parts, about 40 or 50 percent, so almost half of those parts are made right here in St. Mary's area. Um, there are all kinds of jobs in this area because of the powder metal industry. The, uh, I used to work at a company that in that video that Shaman was showing us uh, where, they, where you saw all the flames and the parts were going into the flames, 
there's a couple companies in town, one's called Cinerite, one's called Abbott Furnace, that make it, uh, those furnaces. So I used to work at a company that, that made those furnaces, and I used to travel all over the world selling and working on those furnaces. There's also, just like Shaman was showing us in that video, there's press manufacturers, and there's tool manufacturers, and there's heat treat uh, companies. There's all types of different companies around here, not just the companies that make parts, but there's a lot of companies like mine that support the companies that make parts. Uh, I would think that the majority of jobs in this area has something to do with manufacturing. And like Amy said, October is manufacturing month, and that's why we thought we would uh, get together and share some of the uh, manufacturing jobs in this area with you today. Amy, I don't know what else you want me to, if there's anything else you want me to hit on? So um, what jobs do your employees do during, you know, during the day that you have available there? I have, I have 20 employees, including myself. So we have eight of those 20 employees. They come in and they get what we call a blend sheet. So on that blend sheet, just a piece of paper with instructions for what they need to do, um, how much iron, how much copper, how much ingredients weight-wise that they weigh up with scales. Um, just like you would step on in your mother's bathroom, uh, the scale that you stand on, it tells you how much you weigh. We have those scales here at work, and they weigh up how much powder of each type, and then they put it in the blender like we, like we saw on that video. We add it on the top of the blender, we close the valve at the bottom, and fill that blender up about halfway, and we blend that, spin that blender for about a half an hour, and the guys um, then take a sample of that powder and they do a little test on it called apparent density. And if the apparent density is correct, then they document that on the piece of paper that uh, their work instruction is. And then they pack it out. And packing it out is they open the top valve and then open the bottom valve and drain the powder, gravity flow of the powder into the packaging that the customer wants. Uh, there's all types of different packaging from a 500 pound drum to a 5,000 pound bulk pack, which is just a cardboard box that holds the powder. So those eight employees, that's what their job is. Um, I have three employees that then take a sample of that powder. They'll take just a cup of three or four pounds. They'll take it into our lab and they will do multiple, about 20 different tests on the powder. They'll make little parts out of it, they'll break the parts, they'll take the parts and put it in a small furnace thinner them, and then they'll check the hardness of those parts. They'll also then break those parts after centering. They document all the tests that they do, and um, with every um, lot of powder, with every shipment of powder that we make, we have to verify that the powder is what the customer ordered. So what those three employees do is they do the testing, document that, that it is what it is, and then that certificate of analysis gets shipped with the lot of powder to the customer. I have uh, one, one employee that, that is my production manager, so his job is to make sure that those 11 people that we just talked about have stuff to do. So he takes a look at what the orders are from the, uh, the customers that send us the orders, and he puts together the blend sheets and the schedule and makes sure that the powder gets made and shipped in time for the customer's order when they wanted it. I also have a, a lady named Tracy that uh, she takes in all the orders and she arranges all the shipments. So she uh, has conversations with the customers to make sure that um, they know when the powder is made and they know when the powder is coming and if it's going to be on time or not. I have another employee that does all the bills. So there's an accountant. Um, she has an office here uh, right across the hall from mine. She, once the powder is shipped, she makes sure that we bill for it and she keeps an eye on it to make sure that we get paid for what we shipped. 
I also have another employee that uh, goes out to business customers. Uh, he travels around the, all the United States, Canada, and sometimes Mexico, um, and, make, and tries to sell our product. Let's, let's the end user, let's the people out there know what we sell and to see if there's anything we can do to help them uh, with, their, with their needs. So we do have customers from California to Maine, Canada to Mexico, and, and actually I just started selling uh, some powder to South Africa. So our little town, our little company here in Ridgeway, Pennsylvania, we really do have uh, a world presence. Uh, we, we travel the world. I've been to China a few different times. Um, I'm dealing with a company currently in Spain. So if you like to travel, this industry, manufacturing, can definitely, uh, there, there's some room for, for people that like to travel. There's engineers. There's accountants. There's, there's laborers, there's people that are impressive. If you like mechanics, if you like to work on, on your motorcycle or, or four-wheeler, there's definitely a need for people to, to come into this industry and keep the equipment running. There's what they call die setters that are typically really mechanically inclined people that set up the, the tools. There's a bottom punch and a top punch to set up the tools to make these, these uh, parts. There's um, the, the powder metal industry has so many different uh, types of jobs um, in it that you can pretty much IT. If you like computers, if you like being on your phone all the time because you, you like uh, the program stuff, there are, uh, I mean, just like the computers that we're talking and using on right now, there are all types of jobs in this industry which has to do with manufacturing. Anything else, Amy? So what got you into manufacturing and, you know, like what school subjects do you think that you, back in school, you thought I'm never going to use this, but you know, now you use it. Well, I, uh, I always liked working with my hands. I always, uh, liked mechanical stuff. Um, to be honest with you, when I was in 11th grade or so, 10th, 11th grade, I always wanted to know that, um, I always wanted to do something on my own. I eventually wanted to own my own business. My father had friends and the friends that got to go fishing the most or hunting the most or have the most time off or the nicest cars always seemed to be the, the people that kind of were entrepreneurs. And that means that they ran their own business or, or had their own business. So I kind of made a decision that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, I liked racing cars and running demolition derbies. So I thought I'd uh, maybe own a junkyard, take cars, tear them apart, sell parts off of them. But there was some environmental uh, reasons why you can't start a junkyard in, in Dell County. So the next best thing I thought was uh, powdered metal. So I started looking into powdered metal and found that there was a lot of types of jobs that were mechanically inclined in powdered metal. Uh, so I went to school at Penn State to get a two-year degree in mechanical engineering. Uh, mechanical engineering, they teach you how to do all types of math and uh, uh, how to use the math to figure out calculations of, of like how thick to make a part, how much powder to use to make this part, how how strong this part is going to be. If I pulled this part apart, how much strength could it hold up? How much would it take to break the part? So that's all mechanical uh, type engine, mechanical engineering type stuff that I learned when I went to school for a two-year mechanical engineer. After getting a two-year degree down at Penn State Du Bois, uh, it wasn't a lot of, it was one more year to get an additional two-year degree in metallurgy which is heavily leaned on powdered metallurgy. So I came out of school with a two-year degree in mechanical engineering, a two-year degree in metallurgy, and just started working um, at a couple different, I've been at four or five different companies in the area, and learned a lot on the job the last 20 years that I've been uh, working in the powdered metal industry. 
All right, well, thank you. That's great information um, all about manufacturing for the kids to hear. Do you have any last minute comments before we move on to our to finish our activity? I truly believe anybody can become anything they want to. And uh, if you want to become something, just go for it. And don't worry about what anybody else has to say. Just work hard at, at what you want to become. And you can become anything. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move on to the activity to finish it up. And then if the kids have some questions afterwards, um, we'll open it up to them, OK? Sounds okay. good. Natalie, do you want to take over and finish the activity? Absolutely. So all of you go ahead and grab your bag of cereal. Again, mine, um, I took a little time while uh, Mr. Gobbler was talking to, to mush it a little bit. So if you still have some big chunks in there, go ahead and squeeze the bag kind of lightly to mush it. And we talked about um, something, and, and I even heard Mr. Gobbler say the specific metal that um, that we will find in this cereal. So one of the one of the things that is found in breakfast cereal that's also important um, in small quantities for us is iron. And iron is magnetic. So what we're going to do, and this takes a little bit of time and a little bit of patience, um, you're going to take your magnet and you're going to Keep it, you're gonna press it onto the bag. You can lay your bag down, try and get all of your cereal into one area. And you're just gonna carefully rub that magnet along your cereal. Now there's a couple different ways you could do this. You could do it this way. You could hold the magnet underneath your cereal, but you don't wanna let the bag, you don't wanna let the magnet come away from the bag because as soon as you do that, that iron goes right back into that solution, okay? So you can kind of rub this along here. And what you're going to find if you don't move it is after you do it for a while, if you turn your magnet, you're gonna see some tiny little black specks. And those are going to be the iron because what you're doing when you do this is you're pulling that iron right out of the cereal with that very strong magnet that you have. So go ahead and um, you can see how I'm holding my bag and just trying to to reach all parts of the bag because once you catch some of those little iron shavings, they're going to kind of stick to that magnet as long as you don't pull that magnet away from the bag. Now, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it. Um, I don't think you're gonna be able to see it in mine, but I can already see some tiny little iron shavings. If you get any iron shavings, raise your hand if you can start seeing them. You see how I do this and then I, I turn my magnet a little bit and pull it away just a little bit and I can see all kinds of little black shavings in there. Anybody, if you can see those little black shavings, raise your hands because if you have friends around you that are having trouble finding those little black shavings, then you can, you can maybe help them by seeing yours. And the longer you let this sit, the better it's going to work. So teachers, are, are any of our students finding some of the little iron shavings in there? Ooh, I see some hands going up. I do see some hands going up. Awesome. What iron is important for in our bodies. You guys are fifth graders. You might know this. Does anybody know what, what's it, how, why iron's important in our bodies? What the main purpose is? Somebody knows and wants to guess. Maybe you can come to the. We have one that knows here. Did you say you know? Oh, does anybody know why iron's important to your body? Isaiah, do you know? Isaiah, you know why iron's important to your body? Oh, they're raising their hand about seeing the iron. Oh, seeing the iron. All right. Uh, does anybody know? Mr. Kasky, do you know? That's somebody that knows. Oh, oh. go ahead. Uh, is it important for your blood? It is very important for your blood. Good job. So iron is what's found in hemoglobin. It's the, it's the very middle of the hemoglobin molecules. And so it helps to transport oxygen to different parts of our body. So really good. That's awesome. 
So we don't need a whole lot, but but there's always a little bit in there. I'm getting a really good amount of iron coming out of my bag. If I pull it, see how I'm pulling it slowly away. I rub it on the side and I pull it slowly away. Is everybody else seeing some iron in there? I did this at home and I was able to pull it down to the bottom, down to the corner, down to the bottom. You can sometimes see it better if you pull it down oh, to the bottom. Oh yeah, so if you do this, I do see my, my iron down here. I don't know if you guys can see the little, well, I don't think you can see the little black dot in here, but I have a little black, oh yep. yeah, there you, can. you guys see the little black dot? So what Mr. Goldberg saying is just do this on the bag and then you can pull it down and you get that little black dot and then you can move that little black dot. Oops, I'm not right in front of my camera. Huh? You can move that little black dot. So see if you can pull it. There's quite a bit down there. That was a good idea. Because otherwise it just dissolves again. So if you can do that and pull it right down into the into the bottom, you guys can see it a little bit better. Isn't that cool? So if you you read the nutrition label on any of these, um, any cereals, Total has a really high amount of iron. That's why they use Total. But um, that's a good activity to try. Now you can. Um, that's a pretty easy activity to share with your parents too so you can you can share that with them but i'm going to pass it back over to amy because i know we're getting close to when the bell's going to ring and i know amy has a little bit of a closing so if you didn't find your iron keep looking okay yeah, i think we might have a minute if any does anybody have any questions um for mr gobbler or any questions in general about uh anything you saw today anything about manufacturing I got one question. Is Kaylee Gobbler out there anywhere? I think no. I think she, she's in Miss Lidewinger's class. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I don't know if they have video. No, she, she actually went to the bathroom. <laughs> she just she just left. <laughs> Jacob here has a question. So go ahead. Is the, is the iron edible by itself? Uh, Natalie, do you want to take that question? That's a good question. Um, no, you should. It's, I mean, it's it. What iron is when they put it into foods is it's something that it's a way that they fortify the food. So scientists study the amount of iron that's appropriate to go into um, into the different foods and the amount that is useful and not harmful to people. So very good question. You shouldn't eat iron because it would be too much. Um, the amount of iron that you see in this, in this total, like I wouldn't even, I, I wouldn't even recommend eating that. It might be if you were in a factory um, that was that had powdered metals in it and you, I mean, it might be a tiny amount that when you're breathing, it might be like the particles might be in the air and that won't hurt you. But no, you should not consume different, you know, you should not consume metals like that because it would be, um, it would be dangerous for your health. Another thing that I've done with these and Mr. Gobbler, this might be interesting for you to know is we've made um, metallic or, um, like slime out of the powdered metals that come out of um, they come out of some of the the companies local to us. So that one's a fun activity too. But that would have been a little too messy for us today. So <laughs> something a little bit easier. Okay. Do we have any any more questions before we finish up? Oh, Jocelyn was first. Okay, Jocelyn. Are there like powdered metals in any other types of foods, like other than cereal? What was that question? Is, are there any other metals in other foods besides cereal? That's a really good question. So have you guys studied the periodic table in chemistry? Have you guys taken chemistry classes? Not yet. Not yet. 
Well, the, um, the periodic table has a whole bunch of different elements and a lot of those elements have metals or are metals or have metallic properties. So when we think of things like magnesium, which is also important in our bodies, iron, which is important in our bodies, there are a lot of different metals that in small amounts we do consume in our foods and they're very important to us. So there's a whole, um, a whole neat thing that you can learn by studying chemistry. And I hope you guys get to that soon. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that Kaylee actually came back. Hi, Kaylee. Hi, I'm Kaylee. Hey, let me take a picture. Here, <laughs> turn around. Oh, oh, oh. Bye, Kaylee. We'll see you tonight. Bye, <laughs> Do we have another question? Okay, well, I think we're gonna wrap it up then. And I just wanna thank Mr. Gobbler for joining us um, and sharing what everything that he um, can bring us to this area with his manufacturing powders and uh, sharing about uh, some careers in manufacturing. And I wanna thank um, Natalie for uh, joining us to help us with our activity today and, and being our science guru. Thank you for asking me. Yeah. All right, then I think we're just gonna sign off then. Great, thank you guys. Thanks for taking the time. Sorry about the crazy. Oh, Not a problem. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.